Welcome to another episode of At Home with Taylor Jackson. Today, my guest is Blair Ellistad. He is a great friend of mine who is a wedding filmmaker, a music video creator, and also just someone that we tend to lose drones and break GoPros whenever we go places. So uh, let's get into the talk. Welcome to my conversation with Blair. Uh, Blair has been a person that's been in my life in multiple different ways for quite some time now. And yes. we met at a wedding a long time ago. Uh, and then we've done a little bit of commercial work. We've done some music videos together. We've done all kinds of weird and unusual experiments. Sometimes things don't come out. Like we were in Las Vegas and we tried to record a thing and we just never, never did it. Um, so I'm not it's, sure what you're uh, talking about. I don't, I don't remember either. I, was, I don't think that actually happened. I, I've never been to no Vegas. <laughs> There's no footage at all from really, really. from what we tried to do. Um, it's pretty much just, I think it came down to just like two hours of random footage at Circus Circus. And, and we just were like, we're just not going to get this done this week. And we took it as a vacation. Yeah. And I, um, I bought a new uh, GoPro for that trip and we hopped in a taxi. And my first shot, I stuck it out the window and it fell out of the taxi. And it's the only time I've ever heard of a GoPro breaking. I've never yeah, like it, it, I've had them fall off of car like all all kinds of destruction and then you drop yours this far from a taxi just to the to the ground and that's it. So and that kind but of I, summarizes the whole experience. Yeah, and then the other uh, the other lost piece of gear. Um, sorry to bring this up if it, if it still affects you. Uh, trying no, to thread the needle with now. the drone. <laughs> so we saw this beautiful mountain range. We were in. Iceland filming um, a video that has not yet come out, but is is mostly complete at least. Still in post production. There's a lot of VFX, <laughs> a lot of a lot of voiceover, <laughs> heavy vo <laughs> some rewrites in the script. Yes, um, and yeah, we we saw this beautiful mountain range and had the idea that wouldn't it be a great shot if we flew the drone through an open window, literally on top of a mountain? And uh, we what what happened there? As soon as it got through, it lost signal. Well, okay, so we were driving, we, we had just left, what was it, uh, Glacier Bay? Is that, yeah. is that the name of that? Yeah. Glacier Lagoon, yeah. Glacier Lagoon, and um, I, I had the DJI Mavic Pro 2, amazing drone, and we were getting some incredible footage flying, I would say, a foot or two off the top of the water, going through all of the, the icebergs, and then Wim Hof showed up. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Wim Hof, the guy that, uh, you know, swims in glacial, glacial waters. He showed up with his crew, took off his clothing and, and hopped straight into the water. And suddenly he was swimming around with seals. And I'm getting this footage on my drone. You guys saw it. We all got a picture with him. Oh. And I distinctly remember saying to all of us, like, this is the greatest footage that I've ever captured with my drone. Yeah. Like, I'm so happy. And then we're driving off, we're driving down the highway, and I think Tim spots that window. I don't know if that's what you would call it, but kind of like an opening that goes straight through the top of this mountain. And it's yeah. probably seven kilometers away. <laughs> <laughs> and we see that, and Tim's like, you should thread that. And I'm like, absolutely. The range of my drone is eight kilometers. So, I mean, if you do the math, no problem. You're fine. Yeah, no problem. And it was totally fine until I got through that window and then I, I started making a turn to come around. And as soon as I lost the, the line of sight, total blackout. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think the drone is still, it, it has to still be sitting. It's still up there. Tim, Tim estimates that there's at least 20 drones up there. <laughs> Something, whatever his math was. I don't know. I, like, I'm not sure how many people would actually try to attempt that. Like, oh, let's thread uh. the needle from eight kilometers away. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, in retrospect, well, whatever. It and was I an experience. Yeah, I have to apologize for, you know, leaving the car for about four hours attempting to climb the mountain. I, I literally was on an adrenaline rush. I was like, I'm, I'm going to get it. I will find this. Of course. Yeah. yeah, of course I'm going to find it. And then Tim I'm not sure what up. you were doing. Yeah, Tim I, came up. I think I, I napped because I was driving. So you guys were, I don't think you slept at all, but Tim, I think, caught, caught a little bit of sleep. And I was like, ah, I should probably just have a quick nap. So as yeah. you guys are risking your lives, um, trying to climb a mountain to retrieve a drone, You're I sleeping. was having a nice nap in the car. It was nice. It was, I saw a horse. But you, you horse were also, you were yeah. protecting, you were protecting our transportation, ensuring yeah. that we had a way. Cause we're, we're in the middle of nowhere. 
Well, so my thing and the reason that I stayed in the car originally was because I figured that at some point it would return to home because drone, that's like the thing when you take off that it's going to come back home. So when you guys ran out, I was like, I'm going to yeah. stay here just so that I can call you if the drone does actually come back. And then after like 10 minutes when it didn't come back, I was like, that's probably... I think you've had a lot of time to come up with that excuse. <laughs> that, was, that was the conversation. That really was the conversation. No, it'll come right back to the car. I'm just yeah, saying. It'll, here. it'll be right here. I'll, be, I'll just nap here. With I'll just be here. It's probably nap. It's probably going to take, you know, 45 minutes to get back. I'll have a little yeah, nap. Yeah. Just, it's, uh, yeah, it's slow mode. And when it's the battery slow. gets low, it, it comes home nice and slow. Um, so, yeah, who, who are you, Blair? Who are you? Uh, who, Introduce who yourself for the, uh, for, for the audience. Who am I? I am, who are you? I am Blair Ellistat. Who I am is many things. <laughs> um, I've been in the, the wedding videography business for about, let's say, let's say 11, 12 years now. Yeah. I think I've actually done, and this is kind of, you know, gross, but over 800 weddings. It's been doing a significant number quite a lot. I, I know that you've done probably a similar, if not more um, yeah. number. I don't even know. One day, one day I'll add it up. Yeah. I stopped counting because every time I add a new one, I just kind of, you know, get this, get this feeling in my stomach of joy and pain. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's been good. And also I am a commercial director of photography, cinematographer. Um, and I've done a lot of work in, in music videos. Um, I guess the most notable one would be, would be Hideaway back in 2014, 2015, somewhere around there. And uh, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of music videos as well. A lot of, a couple of good ones and uh, a whole heck load of bad ones. I'm trying not to swear here. <laughs> PG. Um, but oh. yeah, just been doing a lot of video uh, for the past uh, decade and a couple of years longer after that. And uh, yeah, I think that that's that's me. That's it. That's your life, and uh, that's pretty much all there is. Six hundred words. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. nothing. Nothing else going on at all. <laughs> that's um, me. Yeah. How did you get into weddings? I've, I don't think I've ever asked you this before. So okay, I, I I'll be honest. I never once had the thought like I'm going to be a wedding videographer or even considered the wedding industry as, as somewhere that I would like to work or, or could work. Yeah. And um, the, the way that I came into it, I was living in Montreal and uh, I, I would always make just kind of little home videos, travel videos, things like that. I would go to New York with my wife, Laura, and just kind of, you know, film the, film the trip, just get shots of everything that we were doing. And then at the end I would, you know, make a little compilation video. And for some reason, whenever we had friends over, I would force them all to watch this. I'd be like, guys, <laughs> check this out. Guys, you got to see what I did. And back then the edits were like 25 minutes, like just <laughs> like all of the footage just put on the timeline and then like no adjustments even. Like I went back to, to look at some of the old edits and it's just brutal. But I would, <laughs> you know, I would share this, share the work, share the trip. And one time we had a friend over who had a cousin who was running a wedding video production company. And she, she shared with me that he was looking for an editor. And I didn't have a job at this point. So I was like, absolutely, I'll try out. And so this guy, his name is Rick, Rick Maroney, Maroney Films in Montreal, still going. Uh, he sent me over some footage to kind of do like a trial edit. I downloaded that. Just went to town on it. It was probably the craziest looking wedding, wedding edit that anyone's ever seen. Like super fast cuts, like, uh, like two cuts per beat, like way too fast. <laughs> and he loved it. He loved it. So I had the job and then I was editing at Maroney Video for a couple of years and just kind of, you know, inside the, the wedding company HQ and, and seeing how everything was happening, watching how, how Rick was running the business and, um, my first time actually shooting, this is kind of interesting. We, back, back in this time, we would film on Sony, like Sony beta, no, not beta, but like the, the, the eight, eight millimeter high eight yeah. tapes, yeah. tape cams. Yeah, I mean that, yeah, 2008, 2009. And no so, same day edits. No, we were doing same day edits. 
With the tapes? We would do same day wow. edits and how that was done is we would shoot footage and then at a certain point, one of the, the team members would take off, go all the way back to the office, <laughs> play the tape in real time, so like two hours of footage and recording that through a, a digitizer or, or whatever, like wow. a VHS machine or, and record it on the computer and then start <laughs> editing after you've Jeez. imported that footage and logged it yeah. in Final Cut 7, which is what I, which is what I trained on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, wow. I, remember, I remember my first actual wedding shoot. I wore a Steadicam, a legit, like Hollywood Full level, yeah, yeah Steadicam. I think uh, the pilot model, and I, I have a very clear memory of this because it was so complicated. First of all, like I couldn't get it balanced. Second of all, it wasn't oiled, so it was yeah. very creaky. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was going to be a piece of cake. I was like, look, you just have to kind of walk and it will just float around. That's not how it works. Um, but the worst part for me was at the ceremony, I was trying to do the swoops. We called them swoops. Like, go get a swoop shot. <laughs> swoop around the couple. And we're at the ceremony and it's, you know, it's dead silent. Like, there's no noise whatsoever. And I'm, I'm slowly becoming aware that this creak is, is audible enough that everyone in the, in the church can hear. And so I'm trying to do my swoops like, ee, ee, like trying to adjust the spring and keep it balanced while I'm doing this. And I am just like sweat is flying off of me. I think I had kind of like a lighter shirt on. So I like it's a t-shirt contest. I had this long curly hair probably looked like I had taken acid and then showed up, <laughs> didn't even know where I was. <laughs> and so that literally was the first wedding that I ever shot. Came in super confident. Yeah, I can steady cam, no problem. <laughs> and then it was like the most embarrassing day. That, oh. that happened all day. All day. <laughs> all swoop day man. The they called me swoop man, swoop man. Oh, that's oh. great. I, I'm, I'm crying because of, I've, even like I feel so uncomfortable even when my shoes make noise or if I'm in a church with like a wood floor and just like the little creaks, I'm just so aware of that. So I couldn't even imagine what the sound can oh, roll yeah. through. If, if yeah. you make any sound during the ceremony, like heads are like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then also you're wearing like the full Hollywood style suit. So you're yeah. already a bit of a spectacle. And then exactly. to add to Exactly, especially that, <laughs> 10 years ago, yeah. seeing that at a wedding, people are like, what the... Oh, that guy must be good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, he well, that, wasn't. <laughs> he has no idea what he's doing. It's his, it's his first day. Literally his first day. He literally has never done this before. Yeah. And they call him Swoop Man. Yeah. I used, to, I used to get away with a lot of stuff uh, whenever I shot concerts in Toronto. Um, this, was, this would have been maybe 2004, 2005, 2006, um, before everyone started to get digital SLRs. And when I went to the back door of a concert venue, even if I didn't have a press badge, uh, I would just put on whatever my biggest lens was. And it was like some crappy Safari F 6.3 to eight that there's no way that I could shoot anything inside the concert with, but it looked impressive. And when you show up the back door security guard, like to like kind of recognize you cause you've probably had legitimate access in the past. And you're just like, yeah, yeah come on. Like it, you look familiar it, enough and you've got a big, big camera. Enough. It's, yeah, big it's like, and I'm like, I, switch that out for like the little crappy hundred dollar 50 and that's what i shoot the show on um, so you weren't you weren't shooting the show on a 600 millimeter no 5.6? no no that was um and that was also before so I, I basically i i'm not sure what your first lens was but it was like i aspired to like first get a digital slr then once i had that i'm like i need that 50 to get that really shallow depth of field um so i shot that 50 forever and growing up in kind of skate snowboard scene all I wanted to do was get that super wide angle, like fisheye lens. And then I got it. And then I shot that fisheye for like everything for like five years, pretty much. And then at some point I was like, I should not shoot this at weddings. This is not a wedding lens, but I think I did my first two years of weddings with, um, with the fisheye with, with as like my fish wide eye, angle. Though. Yeah. But that was like 2000, what, 2004. So you can kind of get away with that. Ha have you apologized oh, to fine. these, these clients? Um, no, I can only think of one. No one was upset. Everybody thought it was cool. So, and also like my early clients were all people that I knew from the skateboard, snowboard music scene. So yeah, it was so a little more, 
yeah, it was less weird than me just like showing up to, I don't even know, like a beautiful yeah. black tie affair and being like, what's up everyone? It's like, I think you're too close to get a group shot of everyone. No, nah, I got this. Cause I got <laughs> you're 180 two feet degrees. <laughs> no problem. People on the weird, or people on the end, you're going to look really weird. Cause you're just going to be like bowed in, but <laughs> yeah, it's pretty yeah. Fine. like beastie boys, well, everybody like get much. down. <laughs> ah, oh. So yeah, that was my helping this nasty cold. Uh oh, uh oh, spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, it's just uh, yeah. It's so my nerves. That's how you got into weddings. How did you get yes. into commercial? Because you're you're probably the most successful commercial music person that I know. You've won a lot of things. You've you've been a lot of places. You got a lot of the, the streams on the internet. Um, how did how did that story oh, kind of begin? And how did you get to kind of where you're at now? That is, okay, I don't really have a specific, like I don't have a clear memory of how I got in. I think it was a very slow, gradual pro, uh, progression, um, starting off with, you know, like the corporate talking head videos where you would show up to some, you know, um, small business and, you know, you would talk like in the, in the, um, in the sales meeting, you would say, okay, uh, we're going to sit you guys down and we're going to record you talking about your business. And then I'm going to get, I'm going to get shots of your hands writing notes on uh, the paper. And then maybe Susie over here will get a shot of her hand turning the doorknob to come in. Like just really weird stuff like that. <laughs> Especially back in, you know, 10 years ago when like the 5D Mark II came out and everybody yeah. was obsessed with... Um, shallow depth of field and Boca, you literally can shoot. Yeah, I still am, but it's, <laughs> it's not as like the, the wow factor is not there. Yeah. Like I used to shoot like a can, have it really shallow depth of focus. And then I would show people that shot and be like, look, isn't that nice? Like, what do you think? And people used to say like, wow, you can do amazing things with your camera. That camera. That's why you're so good. Yeah. And uh, so I started doing a lot of, you know, low budget videos and just building up a reel and really focusing on, you know, the client experience. Like I always wanted it to be like, for me, I always want it to be fun. <laughs> like I want it to yeah. be an enjoyable experience. I, I know a lot of times these shoots, like especially commercial shoots can be very high stress. Um, and everybody's, you know, in panic mode and for me, that is just not a state of mind where I can actually, you know, have a clear train of thought and, and do quality work. So I always try to keep things light, keep it fun uh, while maintaining focus on, you know, creating the best quality co work that I can. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, driven towards the, the story that they're trying to share with their, their work or their product. Um, but I think like if I was to you know, sort of share recommendation as to how one would get into doing commercials. I think the only way, unless you, you know, kind of get lucky and you know someone who knows someone, they kind of hook you up with a big job and you just happen to destroy it and, you know, do this incredible, incredible work. I think you have to build a massive, not, not only just a massive portfolio of all this work, like you really need to give yourself that experience to, to learn how to, it's not even learning how to, you know, get a nice shot or record nice audio. Like all of that stuff you can learn relatively quickly. Yeah. The tricky part is learning how to troubleshoot in all of these unique environments that you find yourself in and even just dealing with um, different personalities because everybody in a way is very similar but also completely different. Mm -hmm. And so just being able to come in with a frame of mind, uh, you know, just being open to, to listening to everybody. Like everybody wants to talk on a commercial, on a commercial set. Like yeah. everybody wants to, you know, make themselves seem relevant. Like, I think you should turn that light off. <laughs> That's our key light. <laughs> thanks, like Steve. Will just, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Can you uh, <laughs> get out of the studio, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> like literally people are just saying whatever because everybody's in a panic mode. Yeah. Everybody's in a panic mode. They want to say, they want to seem relevant. Um, but you really need to focus on getting that experience. Um, just 
the repetition, doing it over and over and over again. And for me, I think one of the biggest things was constantly, you know, constantly seeking um, educational resources, whether online or through mentors or even taking courses. Like I've, I've done courses down in uh, LA for, for color grading, done lots of things online. I've, uh, I've even taken course, courses at Harvard <laughs> online, like just whatever I could find. Get just a diploma just, up, in your, uh, up in your studio. <laughs> just keeping, like just trying to fill my brain with as much you know, information as possible. And, and of course, you're trying to find topics that are all relevant to what you do. And as a small business owner, you know, you really have to know a lot, like a full spectrum, uh, yeah. business, finance, negotiation. Uh, entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurialism. Um, th- there are so many things aside from just being able to turn your camera on, plug a light in, make sure the the mic is on. Like there, there's a whole range that you have to learn, and I think experience is just the best way to do that. So, um, if you're if you're in a situation where you don't know how you're going to get that experience, approach a small company, somebody who's new. Offer to shoot a video for 200 bucks or free or 500 bucks. Just kind of feel it out. Get your foot in the door, shoot something simple and see how it goes and just try to learn from probably the many mistakes that you'll make on that and, and just keep, keep building there. Yeah. My, um, a lot of my early mistakes just go into the fact that I didn't really know what I was ever building. Um, specifically, I guess this is speaking more towards kind of commercial shooting as well as documentary style shooting. And I would go in and I, I would exactly what you said that like, sit down, tell me about your business. And then I'd get yeah. five other people to do that. And I'd be like, I'm going to build this in post. And it would take me like 150 hours because I just had so much footage and I had no direction of my story. Yeah. And the more that I start doing it, the more I realize that, Hey, if I just tell them to give me quick, simple answers and I ask them the questions that essentially lead to the script that I'm trying to build that I can go home and I can put that together in like an hour and a half now rather than like the 150 hours. So I think our first documentary that we did um, about startups in the local area here, I'm going to say that we hired an editor. He put 80 hours into it. I'm going to say that I put an additional 80 hours into it um, to build this like 40 minute um, documentary. So uh, the more, I guess the the more you can narrow your scope to what you actually want to be building the easier it's going to be hopefully over time. Um, maybe a question for you. This is just personal curiosity and let interest. Me just, let me just touch on that really quickly because you do bring up a big point, a, a very valuable point, and that's the, that's the planning going into the shoot, pre-production. Yeah. I think pre-production is everything. And when you're speaking to a client, instead of you know, trying to come up <clears throat> excuse me, with, with cool shot ideas, you really need to think about the product. You really need to think about the messaging that they want to convey the storyline. You should always have some sort of a storyline, whether it's high level or low level. Like so it all has to flow together. Every shot, every sound bite, every visual super, it all has to have a reason. Like you need to, you need to know why it's there and be able to explain why it's there. Mm-hmm. And if you can't explain why something is in your video, take it out. Yeah. Um, and then one of the things that I've, uh, with the exception of the, the Las Vegas, the first Las Vegas project that did not, go to plan. Um, but since then we've done some successful projects together so. and the, uh, <laughs> different varying levels of success. Um, but the thing that I really just kind of learned the most, I guess, working with you is specifically one that I think that you have your gear and your technical so dialed that you don't have to think about anything that when you're in there, you're communicating to people, you are actually talking to them and you're understanding and, you're on that level with them while you're just kind of on autopilot um, with your equipment because you just know it so well. And I think that that, regardless of what you're shooting, whether you're shooting weddings or you're shooting commercial or whatever it might be, that so much of it comes down to just being able to communicate with people um, to make them comfortable specifically. Like I rarely work with people that are comfortable in front of a camera and just by having them like, just by having a conversation and the same kind of went with you when, when we were shooting um, our short films that I didn't really know what I was doing. And just by us having a good time and then being like, all right, now do this shot. And it just all comes together and it feels so much better than something that's overly technical plan that we didn't go in with a shot by shot list. We didn't try to execute on that, that we went in with a rough idea and you just Mm -hmm. kind of create within the bounds of that and, I think that that's kind of the right way to do it. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, to your point about, you know, really knowing your equipment, I like that's something I haven't even thought about because I've, I've been shooting. I, I should say thought about recently because I've been shooting for so long. I've used so many cameras and, you know, so many random pieces of equipment because I'm, I'm a huge tech geek. Like I love that stuff. And I used to buy a new camera every three to six months. I was on uh, Canon Rumors. Whenever something new would come out, I would kind of figure out how I was going to pay for it, whether I was going to sell something or take out a loan or steal some money from the family. Um, I was always just kind of plotting. <laughs> Banana stand. Um, but communication really is like the overlying top level thing that you need to worry about because communication is the whole purpose of the medium. Mm -hmm. Whether it's commercial, whether it's wedding, like you are, for, uh, first of all, communicating with the people during the shoot, but also the actual product itself is a communication. Yeah. So just keeping that, you know, in front of mind is so important. Yeah. And um, maybe a question to you out of personal curiosity. Um, so I've noticed specifically with weddings that there have been, <clears throat> I'm going to say like when I was first getting started, it was not unusual to see a video team of five and then three photographers at a wedding. But that was kind of, that was normal, like eight people, whatever that math is. Like that was totally normal. Um, I've seen that scale back now almost to maybe, in some cases, just myself and a second shooter doing both photo and video, or myself and maybe like an external third person that does, is just doing video or something like that. Um, has that kind of come true in the commercial space as well? Do you notice teams just getting smaller and um, is that something that if you're new to the industry that you can maybe kind of leverage that you are small and quick and one human that can get a lot of things done? Yeah, I mean, like the direction that things are going in, in the wedding industry, it's all technology related, like all of this new gear is coming out, things are getting smaller. Um, you're now able to hold, you know, three or four cameras at once if you need to strap lenses all over your body. <laughs> Uh, steady cams are like this big, motorized, yeah. one hand, like this. They don't squeak. <laughs> they don't squeak. And the same goes for, in the commercial world, like the technology is, is so advanced now and so much smaller. And you're, you're seeing a lot of one-man band operations happening. I mean, yeah. I haven't really experienced too much of a shift because I, I think the... I'm going to take one of these out. Bugging sure. me. I, I think like the shoots that I've been doing recently, like I've just been working on this campaign with um, the European Union delegation to Ukraine. And it's a big television uh, broadcast thing that we've been working on. And there have been multiple shoots over several weeks. I was actually supposed to be going back now, but it turns out it's not a good time to fly to Ukraine yeah. or anywhere. Um, but depending on the type of shoot and, and where it's, where it's going to be published ultimately, the requirements are a little bit different. If you are shooting something that's just going to be living on YouTube or the web, I don't think that you need to worry too much about building a crew of 50 people with PAs and, and all that stuff because it's a much, um, it's, it's a much more controlled environment, but when you're working in a broadcast situation where you're literally dealing with, um, you know, heads of the network, heads of the EU, heads of, you know, uh, the Ukraine, like there are so many important details that need to be monitored. So right away you have 10 times more people there. Um, yeah. since it's going to television, just buying that airtime alone is probably, you know, five to 7 million euros. So everything needs to be bang yeah. on. So you have a lot of people hovering over you, a lot of people making sure that every detail, every word is correct. Yeah. Um, so it, it really depends on, and this is not really relating to our target audience in this podcast, but <laughs> if we're talking about you know, smaller commercial shoots, it definitely is shrinking. And I would encourage anybody who's trying to get into this to really focus on learning multiple skill sets. You should, you should know how to edit. You should have a, a, you know, basic understanding of that. A good editor makes a better director, makes a better cinematographer. Like if you have to understand all aspects, you should learn how to do audio. Um, I think the days of an individual showing up on set and only knowing how to do one thing are kind of long gone. Yeah. 
And especially in these smaller set situations, smaller crew situations, a lot of problems are still going to happen. The, the problems that you're going to come across, those haven't gone anywhere. Yeah. The crew has just shrunk and now you are in charge. If you're a one man band, you're in charge of solving all of these you know, all of these obstacles that you come across, whether the yeah. audio is bad, the lighting's off or out of focus. So you, you have to really stretch and expand your skill set. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, I guess maybe due to past events and recent events, um, how the yeah. industry is changing for, for yourself, maybe across all levels of business and what you're struggling with and maybe how we can kind of overcome the, what we're go going through right now. Yeah. So when you say past events, well, just the past couple of, uh, the couple of weeks, basically as like all travels being shut down and, um, now pretty much every wedding probably until July is going to be pushed, um, either later in yeah. the year or until next year. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a very, it's a scary time. It's a really scary time. Like nothing like this has ever happened really. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, and I think especially in, in the wedding, uh, wedding videography and photography and we'll add to the whole wedding business. <clears throat> I think everybody is potentially losing out on a lot of work that's already been, you know, confirmed. Yeah. There's a lot of cancellations happening. I myself am, am getting uh, multiple emails daily with, with couples asking, you know, we were, we're thinking about postponing the wedding or we might have to cancel. And then so I have to respond back with cancellation policies and things like that. And, um, you know, I have to, you have to be really strict about that because I'm, we're all in a position now where we're probably not going to be making a lot of money over the next few weeks. So you, you you can't really give back these deposits. You can't, you know, you, everybody's kind of, it's every man for themselves right now. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of uncertainty and we don't know what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks and months. We can only hope that, uh, you know, the social distancing thing keeps up and uh, everybody stays committed to that. And we can, how do, how do they say it? Uh, level the curve. <laughs> flatten the curve. Flatten Thought it was going to be a, a very insightful uh, quote in Ukrainian or something like that. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that. Suddenly I'm speaking Russian. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden Blair has learned Russian. Right, um, I was there for four weeks and I'm fluent. <laughs> super fluent. Um, so yeah, yes, like yeah. it's, it's uh, a struggle definitely for everyone. I think in all aspects of business, I feel like, one of maybe the positives that we can take from it is that I am getting pretty much my entire back catalog of stuff that I've shot and just not finished editing on or mm -hmm. haven't finished whatever. I owe Blair a bunch of voiceover stuff so we can get moving on a project that yeah. should have been finished yeah. Yeah. like a year Where ago. Those voiceovers from two years ago, Taylor. I, I got, I got the, I got the new mic. So, uh, oh, you got the, sh the sure. Yeah. The, the problem is that the, the gain on it is like, it's not a loud microphone, so it's um, it's not That's a podcast you need microphone. To buy a Rode NTG three secondhand off Kijiji ten years ago, <laughs> four hundred bucks. <laughs> I sold a thousand my, dollar microphone. Yeah, I sold Tim my. Uh, I had an NTG three, so yeah, Tim has it now. Um, Did you? He's doing more commercial work than I am. You got to get um, that back. I will. I'll I'll go find him once we're allowed to see each other in person. <laughs> I, I need my mic back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I feel like for as just like somebody that's been self-employed and kind of been in the weeds for a long period of time, um, both because primarily it's like all self-inflicted and it's all content that isn't necessarily owed to anyone. And that's why I feel that, I don't know, things just kind of drag on. And right. now that we're looking at, or at least I'm looking at my calendar, I'm like, cool, I probably have another month of just like getting all of this done. Right. Um, that's kind of what I find some level of comfort in and some level of yeah. control in that, I wake up and I have a thing to do today that I know that I'm going to work on this today. Yeah. And I feel like if I didn't have that, if I was, um, my previous life was working at an Outback Steakhouse as a server. Yeah. If I was the server at Outback Steakhouse and I was let go um, and I wasn't doing photography, I feel like I would just kind of, I would be in this weird limbo period that it would be awesome for the first week. And then yeah. after that, um, there'd be a lot of struggle. So I, well, I, think, I think most people are in that situation and sorry to cut you mm -hmm. off, but I think most yeah. people are experiencing um, a total loss of their day-to-day -day purpose, mm -hmm. so to speak. 
And uh, luckily for the photographers and, and videographers, we all have a backlog. So, I mean, at least we have something that we can, you know, keep ourselves focused on and, and stay busy with yeah. um, until that, until that backlog is cleared. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for anyone uh, that's kind of going through this that is feeling uncertain? I know that we're by no means the experts in this, that we're also just solo business owners that don't mm -hmm. really know what the next couple of months are going to hold. But um, what, what are your, your positive takeaways? What's your, what's your positive spin on this situation that's overall kind of a big yeah. negative? Well, I mean, first of all, I want to say like this, I hope everybody is, you know, staying safe, staying healthy. It is a very scary time, but if we all, you know, continue just to listen to our, you know, government, medical officials, and just abide by those guidelines, I think this is all going to subside a lot quicker than we think. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot quicker. It's, it's, it's still going to be, you know, I would say a couple months, but now that you have this time, I mean, if I'm going to put a positive spin on this situation, I mean, I'll just tell you a little bit about what I've done. <laughs> Similar to you going to projects that you, you, know, you haven't really been able to give any time to, I've also found some things that I've been talking about, dreaming about doing for, for years and just never found the time to do it. And, uh, you know, as you... As you get older, you're always getting busier. I, I have a son now, he's seven months old. And so right there, like my time is shot. And so what I've been able to do now with this sort of forced hiatus is look at some projects and ideas that I had developed and had been really excited about. And uh, I've been able to give them some life. And uh, mm -hmm. like one of, those, one of those projects for me was creating some online course material. and I've never been able to get through more than 10 minutes of a recording. And in the past two days alone, I've shot and edited and uploaded about four hours of course content. Yeah. And, um, it, it's, and why I'm saying this is because if, you, if you've ever wanted the world to kind of just go on pause, like life to go on pause and just allow you an opportunity to take a step back look at, you know, maybe look at yourself, look at your life, look at the direction you're going in and just think about it and think about where perhaps you want to take the next step when things pick up again. And there are a lot of things that I know we all, you know, are dreaming about doing or, or wishing that we had a little bit of extra time to, to execute. And this could be that window of opportunity. So my advice Turn off CNN. Do not sit in front of the TV all day. Of course, you want to be watching news alerts just to make sure you're, you're on top of what's going on. But really look at your daily, you know, your, your, your daily, I guess, window of opportunity and schedule in some time uh, to, to create some new things. And uh, you really have to force yourself to stay in an optimistic mindset. I mean, I'm really struggling with a little bit of panic and, and fear. And, and my wife is, you know, she's freaking out. My seven-month-old son, he's doing fine. He's just <laughs> laughing. He's singing. He's dancing. He's having a great time. It's like you guys are both home all the time. This is great. <laughs> yeah, we're both home all the time. The dog, is, Bruce, he's a little, I don't know. It's kind of what you were telling me before we started recording. Uh, Richard is, a, you know, he was excited at first that you were there all the time, but now, you know, Bruce is like, kind of why are you guys like, here all the time? Uh, <laughs> yeah, this isn't fun. Are you guys watching me all day? Like, what, what's happening? <laughs> I need my privacy. Oh. But yeah, I mean, it's hard to really give advice in this situation because what's happening? Like, what is happening? Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, by at least having some level of control by just doing the things that I know that I should have been doing a long time ago and mm -hmm. putting those together and even down to like all the, the nice to do things for my business, I feel like have also yeah. been kind of on the back burner and the things that I know that I should have done that I should be doing all of the things that, yeah. um, that I've come up with. Like I should be out specifically in like in the wedding space. I should be at every single venue or at least repurposing old content that I've shot there to make a yeah. venue review, to put it up on YouTube or to put it up on Vimeo or yeah. to blog about it or whatever. And that's just stuff that I know is good practice and I know I need to do it, but other things just kind of got in the way. So I think if there's kind of one time to actually really advance your business, it is 
in this time now, you're going to be creating everything into kind of a vacuum that there's right now, there's at least in the wedding space. Um, actually, today's a bit of a different story. I got three inquiries today somehow. I don't know what's going on, but I guess- I'm still getting inquiries too, and it, it confuses okay. me. I'm like, are you sure? Yeah. You want like, to be you sure? thinking August, about this right now? Okay, cool. Yeah. Last minute wedding um, next week? Yeah. Yeah, really? it's, I hear, hear there's availability at uh, a few venues around here. <laughs> Everything opened <laughs> up. This is on that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, wow, they, they got next Saturday available. Prime venue, prime date. Cool. Um, but the yeah. Inquiry been, from the Amish people. Yeah. yeah. Or who, who was it? Like Jared Leto that was at a silent retreat or something and came home like right. a couple yeah. of days yeah. ago he to be like, the whole thing. What? Yeah. Oh. Uh, unfortunately, that would destroy any progress that he made in that therapy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jared, the world's over. Yeah. It's like, I can't ever do that again. That's just, that's it. It's yeah. over now. I can't ever Shouldn't do another silent this. retreat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think this is like the time that you've, it, you have to be self-motivated enough to know that you're creating content that's not going to have instant results that right. I feel like we're in this community of, or at least mindset of like, when I do a thing, I need that instant feedback. I need that applause. I need those shares. I need those inquiries and those bookings based on the act that I just did. And I think it's important for us to get out of that mindset and to yeah. just realize that creating the future of our business right now, um, right. we have the time to do it. We can do all the stuff that we need to have like for good SEO. We can talk to those vendors. We can make those connections. Um, if you've shot content or you've shot photos or you've shot videos with other people in the past, you can do blog posts on them. You can make yeah. them feel nice and um, get them something to share. And if you're able to help other vendors book stuff in this time, book other yeah. weddings. So like if it's a florist or a hairstylist or makeup artist or a venue, even if you can give them the tools to be successful and you can give them yeah. the tools to actually make money, they are going to be your best advocate moving forward. So I feel yeah. like we kind of all have that time right now and um, hopefully you're taking advantage of it. But also I feel like you kind of have to also understand that if like you do have this time and you shouldn't be forced to just work like 20 hours a day to make your future amazing that there, it is okay to take time off and to relax a little bit. Otherwise you will go a little bit crazy. I think. Sure. I mean, yeah, we all have our capacity as to how much we can put in every mm -hmm. day. But uh, one of the things that's really scaring me, especially when I think about other people in the industry who really rely on being able to, you know, take their physical body to a location and essentially perform the labor of capturing, mm -hmm. you know, with the camera, you're not going to be able to do that for a while. And if that is your main source of income, I think it would be really imperative, like a very smart decision for you to focus on developing alternative sources of, of income and probably online is the best place that you can be looking right now because everybody's there yeah. and there are a lot of creative uh, opportunities. I mean, a lot of you just watching Taylor, of course, can see all the incredible content that he makes. I mean, the inspiration is everywhere. Um, if, you, if you really want to get ideas as to how you can you know, create something new for yourself, it's as easy as doing a little Google search. The one thing that you have to do is put in the work. And, yeah. you know, just be aware of, of where your skill sets lie and what, what you're good at and what you can actually succeed in and uh -huh. focus your energy on that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a time to be very thoughtful, very self-aware. <clears throat> um, you know, monitor your, your emotional reaction to what's happening worldwide because it is crazy. But if you're constantly in, in chaos panic mode, that's not going to do anyone any good. Um, but, you know, I can't speak for everybody's situation. Like, I hope everybody is, is getting through this and staying safe. But, uh, yeah, if you have an opportunity to slow down and think about things, take that opportunity to think about things. Be creative. Yeah. All right. Um, or if, if you want to make money really fast, just start an artisan toilet paper factory. Um, in oh, your basement. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I think we'll leave it at that for today. Thank you for joining me, Blair. Would it be weird I if I suddenly it. just disconnected and I was black screen? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know me, I can change my camera. Any oh. Um, so maybe that would be my exit that all of a sudden just into the, into camera settings. 
Well, you, re- you revealed the settings, focus. which everybody wants to see. Like, what are your settings on this? That's true. Video? I, I don't even know. That might have been the format card box. It shows it to me in reverse on my screen. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a hard time, I think, for everyone. And to focus on what you can do to make your future better is kind of the only yeah. thing that you're really in control of. So um, right. don't stress yourself out. Do the things that you like to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, take time for family and don't go see family if they don't live in your house right now, but you can yep. FaceTime, you can Skype, you can FaceTime you can do whatever. Yeah. Well, Taylor, thank you for having me on. It's thank good to see you. Here. It's always good to see you. I'm happy that our lights and you match. you look good. You look really good. You look, you look, look good too. It's a blue light. Fresh. See, I don't look good. Oh, and then all okay, of a sudden, well, get that back on. Mm, right. See right? that blue light. It does. Huh? It does wonders. Yeah, we both, uh, we coordinated the blue lights and green shirts today. Um, green shirts, yeah. I mean, that's us though. We're the same person. Yeah, every, every day. We and are a, the same. You have, a, you have a very similar lamp as well. You can't see my lamp. It's I do, I do. You also have this this white mic. I did, I did. I gave it to Marshall. Um, Marshall g- brought me this one. He owns Angus Audio in Cambridge, Ontario, if you're interested yeah. in buying anything. Um, okay, and I'll buy. Where's the link? Can you send me the link so I can buy stuff? I think you just have to message him. I can, I can, I can find you a link maybe. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so he's basically what happens is that as I upgrade gear, I give him my old stuff and then he'll either sell it or use it within the shop if they have use yeah. for it. So, um, it's kind of a, <laughs> an interesting your trade downs. forward program. <laughs> yeah. But they, so they do like, they do special events and their industry yeah. just got absolutely hammered too. Um, oh, no. but like as they create things, like they need so many random things to like, yeah. again, kind of to your point of just troubleshooting yeah. anything that can happen. Um, so they need backups of laptops. They need backups yeah. of like microphones and, oh, for sure. um, they, yeah. So they always have, hey, this, is, stuff, this is a so. good mic that you gave him. I mean, that's I like very it. generous of you. Yeah. It looks kind of odd. See you next time. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe. And there are links in the description below to find out more about Blair and a link to his headshot in case you want to print it out and put it on your wall. Спасибо.